All right, everybody. My name's Obsidian, and welcome to a dubious, a dubious splendor. I think it's called. Uh, the following is a work. Uh, the following work is an adaptation of a collection of stories written by the Guju, Gujarati poet Mir Umar Hassan. These stories, entitled "In Dubious Splendor," were written in 1962 for Malwa Chronicle, but were they were mangled and edited without the author's permission prior to the publication in serialized form. The collection became momentarily infamous as the subject of the first court case to arbitrate authorial ownership in independent India. Even today, despite countless restorative efforts by scholars, it cannot be said with any certainty that the text we used for this adaptation was the original as written by Umar Hassan. Ugh. Hit a toggle camera, right to photograph. Ah! Ah! What? Leave or stay? Why? Why would I? What is there for me to see here? God, my control, my controls are like a, like a drunk man. Whatever. Oh, loading sensors. Peter Gregory Cantor was a prolific traveler, the founder of the doctrine of the anthropologists and the tre a treasurer at the Royal Academy. Cantor was known to all civilized world as an authority on the peoples and customs of Hindustan. But even all the knowing Cantor was the, even the all-knowing Cantor was bewildered by the apparatus, an object he wrote parsimoniously, parsimoniously about in his annals and later alluded to with deep regret in the journal that he maintained upon his return to England. The apparatus, as Cantor first described in his book of travels, had no apparent purpose. It was a tubular object of indeterminate shape found in the living spaces of the people of Danta. Often small enough to be placed in an al mariha the apparatus seemed so commonplace to the people using it the Cantor could not ask what it was about without crippling damage to his credibility as a member of the superior race, as he believed himself to be. That it was man-made and not a creation of, creation of nature was but evident, and Cantor made specific mention of its artifice. But beyond that record, nothing else was written about its shape or material, its color or form, or its intended purpose or providence. Cantor was so startled by his presence that he did not even name it, and only called it the apparatus whenever he meant a scant mention of its presence in his annals. It seems that his fascination with the object had not gone unnoticed, and in an act of spontaneous dipl dipl diplomacy, the Raja of Shiturjan, Shiturvan, the province that Cantor was touring, presented him with one of the mysterious objects. But the gift only served to torment Cantor, who found the apparatus a constant reminder of his bewilderment and his failure as a man of knowledge, for he had never worked up the courage to ask what it was. He kept the apparatus at his house in Wellington and made provisions in his will to have displayed at its museum after his passing, hoping someone might shed light upon its mysteries. And to this day, a replica of the apparatus can be found on display, waiting for someone to identify what Cantor never could. That's toothpaste! So, oh. Is that... What? What? Is this for real? Since I could take pictures. Oh, it's my right trigger. Okay. What is this? Can I. Yeah, that's toothpaste, my man! Uh, appears to be. cavity protection. Oh, very good. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I've done good work here. I, don't, I really don't know what I'm supposed to be doing with the toothpaste. I took a picture of it. In the land of Kutur, in the valley of Bitra, there lived a clan of giants. Theirs was a thriving community, content to remain aloof from the other denizens of the world. And though the giants would on occasion trade with the gods or enslave tiny mortals, many, most of them rarely left the confines of the valley. For the giants were always occupied with grand celebrations. They celebrated every event with feasts and revelry, whether it be the occasion of a birth or a bath. Uh. It was during one such celebration, upon the marriage of the great giant prince, Bosho Sikandar, and the princess Buni Begum, that Boshite, Boshite, 
the younger brother of Prince Boshio, commenced a tantrum that threatened to derail the venerable event. Boshite had been re recently witnessed a mortal wedding, wished to have musicians aplenty for his marriage as well. In vain did the gathered guests try to explain to him that giants were not meant to play music, that their hands were not meant for the delicate made for the delicate strumming of the sitar of the ode, or for the dexterous movements of the tabla. In vain did they try to explain that only mortals could become musicians, for their tiny bodies could cradle the instruments with a care that giants could never muster. But Boshete remained stoically seated, cheeks puffed and arms crossed, unmoved by the pleas around him. And so it was that the famous musicians from the mortal realm were called upon to play the wedding of Bojo and Buni. The, mu the musicians arrived the very next day, carried on the back of a giant. Sore from the journey and famished, they were invited to a nightly feast before commencing their performance. But with such unseen splendors of a giant's feast before them, the famous musicians could not help but stuff themselves to the brim. They ate until they were unable to talk and move, far less sing and play and could not be roused from their slumber when called upon to entertain the giants who had gathered for the wedding. The wedding guests were furious at the insipidity of the musicians that they had gone to so much trouble to acquire, and Boshete called for the musicians to be punished. With giant jails too large to contain such puny creatures, the musicians were all thus imprisoned in a box that was lying about. It is this box, retrieved long after the reign of giants had ended, that now edifies a room at the museum. It's a cassette, and chickens for some reason. Whoa. Okay, there are no chairs here, I wonder why that is. Also no hands. Oh, hey. Well, those are the same symbol. This is new. So we're gonna follow. We're gonna follow the symbols that seem different. What? What? There was no poem for this one. It was just. <sighs> What's above me? Nothing's creeping along the ceiling. I will say, this game is very interesting, but... When Daroji died and his funeral was completed, all that was left was for his lawyer, Meta, to distribute his property, as bequeathed in the will. The house was divided between the three sons and the families, and the rest of the property, property similarly dispatched to other relatives. Every tiny object from the cutlery to embroidered kurta, and even the table fan with the bent blades were given to some member of the family distant and close, with the carefully drafted note of personal import that Doroji had written prior to his passing. Such a meticulous distribution of his earthly acquisitions did not surprise Meta, who in Doroji had found both a conscientious colleague and lifelong friend. So it came as some surprise to everyone he found an apparatus in Doji's, Do, Doroji's possession of which no mention at all was made in the will. Try as he might, Meta could not discern any use for the object. No one in the family had seen or ever heard of this quaint apparatus, and its purpose could not be fathomed, nor its materials identified. And pl its place of discovery was also surprising, for it was found on Doroji's deathbed, resting below his head in the moments prior to his death, as if it were a possession of great value. Bewildered by this unexplained object, Meta was only too glad to donate to the museum, where it now resides. What? Wait a second. Why is this door blocked? Let me in. I see a problem now. I'm gonna look at that in a second. That's a pillow. That is very strange. Feels like we're... Feels like something's going on. Guess I'm going here. What? How am I... 
walking on this. Oh, because it's probably like glass. Okay, so... What does this all mean? A long time ago, when the forest had ears and the sun was still a sparkle in Elfro's eye, Sean Turmul, the god of seashells, found Grudelbeg, the thunder god, perched despondently upon the edge of the Himalayas. Oh, Eve, ever eager to help, Sean Turmul asked his fellow mortal what ailed him so. Excuse me. In Gr Grudelbeg meant, moaned in reply, Oh, Sean Tour, I cannot help but bemoan my sorry state. If only I had an extra pair of eyes at the back of my head, then I wouldn't have to turn around to see what was behind me all the time. And Shuntormol, after careful thought, said, There's only one craftsman in all known locus who can build such a pair of eyes. Who is this right? demanded Girdlebeg. And Shuntormol replied, He is called Ego and lives in the forest of Gundr. Possessed by an urge to have a pair of eyes attached to the back of his neck, Girdle Girdlebeg, that's been spelled several different ways, j journeyed to the mortal world. Here he decided to disguise himself as a mendicant and soon appeared at the doorstep of Ego's workshop. Inside sat the master craftsman, surrounded by clocks and astrolabes, armillary spheres and sextants, and devices even the god could not recognize. He appeared to be working assiduously and paid no heed to his visitor. O oh, Ego, of the fabled hands, cried Grudelbeg, the mendicant. Long have I said to myself, if only I had a pair of eyes at the back of my head. Will you not craft me such a, me one such a pair? You shall have my heartfelt blessings in return. Ego replied without looking up. I am too busy, much too busy. With that, he refused to say any more. Grudelbeg returned to the forest next year, this time disguised as Pasha with a retinue of armed and mustachioed guards. He reached the workshop and found Ego at his bench, as if no time had elapsed since the god had last been here in the guise of a mendicant. O oh, Ego of the fabled hands, growled Grudelbeg the Pasha, long have I said to myself, if only I had a pair of hand eyes at the back of my head, you shall craft me one such a pair, or I shall have my guards throw you to the crocodiles. And still, Ego, engrossed in his work, replied with a dismissive shake of his head. I am busy, much too busy, and with that, refused to say more. His patience wearing thin, Grudelbeg snapped himself into his natural form, and reappeared at the workshop in all his godly glory, and still Ego would not deign to look up from the work that absorbed him so. Ego, thundered Grudelbeg, his voice like a boom of a cannon. Long have I said to myself, if only I had a pair of eyes at the back of my head. I demand you craft me one such pair immediately. And again, the unheeding ego replied, Later, I will craft it later, for I am busy, much too busy. Defeated in his quest and bewildered by ego's preoccupation, Grudelbeg demanded, But what is it that absorbs you so that you are building so assiduously? And ego looked up with alacrity, revealing an object. Alacrity. Cradled in his palm, and he declared, Look, I am building the apparatus. Yeah, I mean, kind of odd imagery. Ooh, pretty. All right. And on this note, I leave you guys. I'd re I'm. There's a lot of reading in this, but it's also very interesting. So I would recommend checking it out when you get some time. It's free on Steam. And don't worry, they're not looking at you looking for you. Goodbye. <laughs> what is that? What the hell is happening? What the hell are those? Oh no! Excuse me sir, have you heard the news of Jesus Christ? The good news! I got the good news! 
direct to the soul. <laughs> <laughs>